suddenly this thing appeared out of a brown envelope, a bulky brown envelope, which had uh, wires and uh, all sorts of electrical um, protrudences on, on it set in balsa wood. It didn't go off because there was a... Scotland Yard told us there was a fault in the trigger mechanism, uh, other, a small wiring fault that um, prevented it from going off. Otherwise, they said it would have blown the whole house up, let alone me and my parents. Welcome back to Crisis What Crisis, the podcast that aims to guide you towards a more resilient life and whatever it might throw at you. If this is your first time with us, welcome and please do hit subscribe wherever you're watching or listening. It really does help make sure that these, I hope, useful conversations are shared as widely as possible. Our guest today is someone whose remarkable life was forged in crisis. Born in Nairobi in 1950, Lord Peter Hayne, as a very young child, moved with his parents to South Africa. His mum and dad, Walter and Adelaine, were young members of the Liberal Party and passionate anti-apartheid campaigners. Their peaceful but determined activism and the dramatic crises that engulfed his family were the backdrop to Peter's upbringing. The Haynes were constantly harassed by the South African security services. Aged just 10, Peter was woken by agents searching his bedroom for incriminating documents. A year later, his parents were jailed for supporting Nelson Mandela's defiance campaign. They were later released, but the impact on the family was devastating. And when a close family friend, John Harris, was convicted and executed for the bombing of a railway station, an attack which his family condemned, it was Peter, aged just 15, who spoke at the funeral. Unable to earn a living, Peter's parents later moved to the UK in 1966, exiled, in fact, from the country that they loved. Peter joined the British anti-apartheid movement and, aged just 19, became the chairman of the Stop the 70 Tour, which organised direct action against South Africa's proposed cricket tour of England, which was eventually stopped. A major success for the anti-apartheid movement. Peter famously led demonstrations that disrupted sport, including South Africa's 1969 UK rugby tour. Reports of those protests even reached Nelson Mandela, then in prison on Robben Island. Mandela would become a close friend. Peter's campaigning led him to be despised in conservative British society and seen as a traitor, public enemy number one, in fact, by white South Africans. He was followed and bugged by MI5, received death threats and was the subject of an assassination attempt. A letter bomb sent through the post to his home, which thankfully failed to detonate. A life in British politics beckoned for Peter, but not before. More extraordinary drama and crisis. We'll talk about that. As a Labour politician, he held office as Welsh Secretary, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions and Northern Ireland Secretary, playing a key role in negotiating the power-sharing settlement of 2007. His time in politics also brought more personal crisis, a donation scandal that he described as a soul-searing experience. Now in the Lords, Peter continues to campaign on a whole range of issues as an author, He's also written 29 books, including biographies of Mandela, his own brilliant biography, A Pretoria Boy, and a series of novels that focus on the crisis of animal conservation. The latest, The Elephant Conspiracy, has just been released. So, an awful lot to talk about with someone who has lived, breathed, experienced crisis from so many different angles. Peter Lord Hain, welcome to Crisis What Crisis. Thank you, Andy. Good to be with you. Peter, even with that abbreviated summary, um, it's hard not to conclude that you appear to be someone who's quite comfortable in the company <laughs> of crisis. Well, listening have I, have to... I, have I got that right? <laughs> listening to what you, you, you know, you're reciting, it, it may sound like that, but it's not the way I recall it, not the way I see it. Yeah, a lot of crises happen to our family, to me, and crises are part of politics, as you know better than anybody else. <laughs> But I don't, I don't feel it to be to have lived a life that is constantly tormented by crisis. Yes. More that things happened, and then it's how you react and how you deal with them. Uh, we'll get into this in more detail, I'm sure. But there are several moments in your life, points in your sliding doors in your life, where, you know, most people I think would have pointed themselves back towards somewhere safer. Calmer, bit easier, 
and, and each time when those moments come in your life, it seems actually that you turn the other way, you turn into the wind, if you like, and and sort of you know shoulder down straight into what you know will be controversial, difficult, you know, uh, uh, hard moments. That seems to be your instinct. I suppose there are two sides of that. The one is if a crisis hits you, then you have to deal with it. And I suppose the first one that I can think that really hit me, and you referred to it uh, in passing, was being woken up as an 11-year-old in the early hours of the morning to be told my parents had been put in jail. Mm. Not, you know, for stealing something or beating somebody up, but just for planning a leaflet to support Nelson Mandela's call for black workers normally serving the the white community in Pretoria where we lived to stay at home in a, in a, a kind of a strike uh, defiance and I remember being quite frightened about it but then I was the eldest of four boys uh, of four children rather a, a, a brother and two sisters and so I needed to wake them up to tell them what were the conversations like with your dad uh, I mean when your mum and dad came back because they were arrested they were they were thrown in a cell uh, they were thankfully released not that long after, I don't think, and came home. But it was perfectly clear that this was going to be the beginning of a very difficult period. The harassment, the following, the kind of agents at the end of the drive, people coming into your bedroom. This was, this was the kind of beginning of all that. What were the conversations like around the kitchen table? Because you did have this kind of two-track life where they were wonderful parents. Pretty nice, actually, middle-class life, it sounds from the book. Lots of normal stuff going on, lovely school you know, playing a lot of sport, and then this other track in your life that you've just touched on that is completely surreal for an well, adult, let alone a child. Yeah, it was certainly very different from any of my cousins, any of my school friends. I mean, they lived a normal white South African childhood, uh, a life of, of that kind of thing. And so, for me, we, we were always slightly different, and yet they were the same. So I'd be playing cricket or football uh, with my mates. Um, but I remember when my dad was issued with a banning order, and we'll no doubt come to that, one of the clauses of the banning order is you couldn't go on an educational premises. It was designed to stop you being politically active. Mm. And so he came to, he always used to come and try and watch me play crickets after work, after work had finished, and I'd be playing in the afternoon into the evening uh, on mostly sunny days. <laughs> in fact, they always seemed like sunny days. Uh, and this time, and from then on, he stood the other side of the school fence on the street to watch uh, because he couldn't... He's not allowed. He wasn't allowed to come, as he always had, uh, alongside the, so the field to, to watch us. And I remember my, my fellow cricket schoolmate saying, what, what's your dad doing over there? And I said, it's because he's, issu he's been issued with a banning order. It's against the law for him to come inside the school premises. And they didn't know what a banning order was, and for them... It was just very odd indeed. But that's also a sort of very poignant picture, right? You're a young lad having to see his dad through a fence. Knowing the, I mean, I mean, the conversations at home, Peter, how was this explained to you? Or did it just... Did you work it out for yourself? No, it was explained. Mum and Dad were very good at explaining things to us, what was happening. They took quite a lot of... made quite a lot of effort for me as the eldest but also m my fellow siblings to um to uh, explain what was going on and they had actually warned us in weeks before that the pressure was building up right um that they might be detained a lot of our friends were being detained we knew of other people who were being arrested uh, uh were jailed issued with banning orders and the police were constantly parked at the bottom of our, our drive or outside the gate. We were under surveillance the whole time. Sometimes I'd be followed to school on my bike. All that kind of thing was going on, and yet they were also normal, doing, doing what normal parents do, helping you with your schoolwork, um, giving you advice, telling you off if you did something wrong. Your parents sound incredible. Well, I thought they were, but they would describe themselves as ordinary people. Mm. But they were ordinary people who did extraordinary things yeah. because only an infinitesimally small percentage of the white community stood up against the apartheid system that gave them the most privileged existence in the world. Yes. Do you remember the anger at that age? 
No, I, you know, I've never been somebody who's got terribly angry. Uh, I've got annoyed about things that I think are unjust or wrong or, you know, the situations we all find ourselves in which cause the temperature to rise. But angry... I think anger tends to sort of boil over into something that's not controlled and I, that's not something that I've ever felt I wanted to do. You know, getting annoyed, yeah, but anger implies you're boiling with rage and you want to clock somebody and, and all of that. What's the point? And is that is that born out of the lessons that you were getting from your parents, you know, let's say around that kitchen table? Because they were clearly, you know, passionate about the cause, the anti-apartheid cause. Uh, uh, but you didn't see them get angry about it? Oh, yeah, my mother particularly had uh, was a very emotional uh, person and she would get angry. She'd get angry from, with us from time to time if we were misbehaving uh, and give us a smack, which wouldn't be allowed today, but never bothered us except it deterred you from doing it again. Yes. Um, my dad was much more stoic and uh, phlegmatic and it, he was somebody who would tell you off or he would, you know, reprimand you or explain why he thought what you were doing was wrong. But he would very seldom shout and scream. My mum was slightly different, different temperament. Mm. I think probably I've learnt, learnt more and absorbed more and imbibed more, might be the better term, from my dad, who was, you know, a fairly phlegmatic character. Um, can we talk about John Harris? Yep. He was a family friend. Uh, also an activist, but someone whose activism, I hope I sort of put this in the right way, it, it took a slightly darker turn. Um, your parents did not believe um, in violence. It seems he did. And although there was evidence that he attempted to give a warning ahead of the bombing of a railway station... He did give a warning. He but, did give a, yeah. he did give a, he did give a warning. Um, his, attack, um, his attack, you know, killed a woman and injured others. Your family condemned the attack, but continued to support him and his family, actually for a, num for a, for a long time thereafter. Yeah, I mean, what happened was there were a group of younger, radical uh, activists in the Liberal Party of South Africa, but by that time, we're talking about 1964, mm -hmm. when I was 14, um, by that time, the rest of the anti-apartheid resistance had been suppressed. Nelson Mandela was on Robben Island. Many of his um, senior leadership comrades were as well. So the Liberal Party of South Africa, particularly in the citadel of apartheid, this is the capital, the, the state, the seat of government mm. of, of the country where we lived, uh, was that my mum and dad and the Liberal Party generally were kind of centre stage for harassment by the security services who were ruthless. People died in prison, people were assassinated, people disappeared, and so on, aside from being arrested and issued with banning orders. And so there was a group of young radicals, including John Harris, who was a teacher, a devoted teacher, <clears throat> as was his wife, Anne, uh, and, uh, and a very good teacher, got increasingly frustrated. They thought, well, you know, Marches had got you nowhere, petitions had got you nowhere, letters to the government and to the newspaper had got you nowhere. We need to do something more dramatic. So he planned um, with a fellow conspirator, John Lloyd, one of his closest friends, both Liberal Party members, he planned what he saw as a spectacular demonstration of defiance against apartheid, faced with these, you know, the suppression of, of all non-violent, peaceful, legal opposition. And he gave a 15-minute warning. He placed a bomb in a, in a, in a suitcase on a, on a, uh, a station um, platform. He gave a 15-minute 15 15 warning to the police and to newspapers, which was recorded in court and not disputed by the prosecution when he was tried for this. Uh, but they deliberately ignored it. And the evidence subsequently came out that it actually suited the head of security and the police minister, subsequently Prime Minister John mm. Foster. So the bomb went off. Um, my parents didn't know who'd committed it. He was a family friend. I remember him coming around to our house and always interested in sport and he'd got a new Volkswagen Beetle, 
and was driving us very fast around corners, which my brother and I enjoyed. So he was that kind of guy, playing table tennis with him and so on. But then nobody. Then we heard about the uh, the bomb going off on the radio, and I remember listening to it and going to talk about it to my mum and dad, and they didn't know who'd committed it. And the next day, um, John's wife Anne, a, a close family friend, arrived with I think a six month, six week old baby David, uh, to say that John had been detained in Pretoria, not Johannesburg, where they lived, and she couldn't drive. Could my mum and dad um, take? food parcels to to him and they immediately said well you know you can't commute from Johannesburg when you can't drive which is 45 minutes away um, why don't you move in and at that stage they still didn't know that he was actually the bomber right uh, because lots of people were being detained many of their friends were being detained yes uh, it was only later that they found out and that Anne had known all along but they took a decision to stand by his family and, in a sense, by him, even though they fiercely opposed what he'd done. And with a degree of risk to themselves. Oh, then. yes. I mean, that whole episode accelerated the crisis around the family because my dad was banned soon afterwards. The The pressure on us when when it was known that we were... You know, we, we had provided a roof for uh, over the head of, of John Harris's wife and baby, mm. you know, was pretty kind of fierce because that bomb going off struck fear into the white community. Yes, yes. Uh, they yes. were used to blacks dying, but they weren't used to n uh, numbers of their own people either dying or being injured, as in this case. Yes. And then, of course, another layer of darkness. He's convicted, he's sentenced to death, uh, he, that execution is carried out, and that's a. Before we get to you speaking at his funeral, um, that is a horrific set of circumstances for a young child, you and your brothers and sisters, to be right at the centre of. Well, yes, it was because we didn't know much about hanging by the neck, but I had discussed with my dad his opposition to capital punishment and why he didn't agree with it and he was quite widely read and uh, he quoted various authors like Albert Camus and others that, that um, were prominent at the time who were arguing about the death penalty. So we'd had these discussions that here was suddenly a close friend who was about to be executed. And, you know, being hung by the neck is a pretty grisly mm. business. I describe it. In, you do, yeah. <clears throat> and I thought it was important to describe it because I researched it afterwards because it's it's truly depraved. Mm. But so we were thinking about this and, you know, my brother and I were thinking, well, can we, James Bond style, try and get him out of prison? With, you know, we were little boys, it was all a fantasy. We talk about kids being tougher than you think and uh, they kind of get through these things and, you know, they're, you know, the young people are so resilient. Well, you know, what impact do you think all that actually had on you? And, and let's, let's talk about that in the context of, let's explain, I think I'm right in saying very soon after the execution there is a there's a funeral. I, I think I'm right in saying you know, yes, he, he was days. executed at five a.m. in the morning. Yeah, and uh, I think the funeral was at seven a.m. So it was pretty close. And you're tasked with standing up at the funeral in your school uniform and and yes, because I was due to go to school that day and did after the the funeral. But what had happened was only the night before, my dad, who was banned as I've explained, he was suddenly refused permission to, uh, to, to perform the funeral address. It wasn't a eulogy, it was simply the order of service and a poem and No Man is an Island, John Donne's poem, uh, and then reading through, uh, announcing the, the hymns to be sung and things like that. Uh, we shall overcome the battle hymn of the Republic, we're in it. So he had, um, with Anne and my mum's input as well, because they were very much a team, my mum and dad, had prepared this address. And and suddenly there was nobody to to deliver it. Because they weren't allowed to. They were not allowed to. Um, and I didn't expect to do it, but I said, well, can I, can there anything I could do? And Anne said, well, would you, would you do it? So there wasn't really anybody else, so it wasn't that I was... 
I was, um, as it were... You're 15 years old, Peter. Yeah, I know. Uh, and I, funny enough, I'd never wanted to be on the stage. Uh, people may not believe this now, but I'd never wanted... I've so never public been... speaking, it's not like you... you, uh, you no, know... no, no, I'd never been in a school play. Right. Anything like that. So it was pretty nervy, but... Um, can you remember the moment now? Can you sort of picture yeah, I, it? Yeah, I certainly can. I can remember being taken up to the... And I've been back to the chapel, which is still there, unchanged from that day on, uh, in 1965. Really? It was the, the 1st of April, April Fool's Day, some might I think I think I'm say. right in saying that it was your responsibility to press the button. Yeah, that was the most scary that, that thing. Sent, that sent the coffin off. Because, no, because they, my mum and dad had said, I hope you're going to be OK, and uh, this is what you should, want you to read this out, and so I was able to rehearse that a bit. But nobody had said, there was the coffin uh, next to me, Nobody had said um, that there was a button, and at what they I think they might have said you have to press a button, but to to uh, to release the uh, the coffin to be cremated, and to go through the sort of doors that open as we all know from crematoria, but nobody had said when to do it. So that in the middle of this, I thought, when should I do it? And I thought, well, probably the best time is during the. The song immortalised during the American civil rights marches by Martin Luther King and Joan Baez and so on, uh, we shall overcome. So it was during that that I pressed it. But that was the most My the thing that wasn't you know that I remember most about how scary it was. I suppose what sits behind the question is is there will be people listening to this? You know, as you know, this podcast is all about you know lessons for crisis. Yeah. And I suppose the lesson that I'm that, I, that this question is related to is. Is, is how do we behave around you know our children, young people in, in the orbit who find themselves in the orbit of crisis? I mean, in terms of advice for for parents, and I'm I'm a parent myself and a grandparent of seven seven grandchildren, uh, is that I think you have to set an example. You have to try and be your best. None of us are <laughs> our best. We're all imperfect. We all make mistakes. We all do things that are wrong. That's in the nature of being a human being. But they were not, they didn't reveal much of their um, anguish about everything. I think they shielded that a bit from us. Mm. Though my mum suddenly, you know, that was often, often evident despite her doing that. I think it's the fact that you were living a normal life as a kid juxtaposed with an abnormal life. If there'd been no normal side to it, if it hadn't been the fun side to it, of birthdays and, you know, um, fun around the house that all parents have with their kids, as well as the frustrations they have with their, kid, their kids. Um, I think if it hadn't been that, if they were just 100% political, mm. and there have been some uh, families, white families, in a similar situation where there were breaches with their kids, mm. because I suspect that there wasn't enough time or emotional, I don't know, room, yeah. space to to just be normal parents yeah. and, and doing your best. Well, the only conclusion you can reach again, as I've already touched on, is your parents were clearly astonishing people. I think they were, uh, but they didn't see themselves that way. They no. kept saying, look, you know, you think of the Mandelas, the Sasulus, all these people mm. who gave up their life, the best years of their life, the people who died, the people who, you know, uh, were uh, were killed by the police. That yeah. what we did was was small stuff compared. Well, with the that. truly astonishing people really do see themselves as astonishing. Exactly, it's the ones that do that you need to that worry you need about to watch. For, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the situation, uh, as we've touched on, becomes a lot worse for your family. It becomes impossible for your dad, just from a practical level, to earn a living. He's an architect, I think, um, and you are essentially, as a family, driven out of South Africa, and you come to London. Um, it was impossible, by the way, because the government issued instructions through security services that he was not to be employed as an architect specialising in hospital design. Just tell me, uh, arriving in London, uh, how did that feel? Do you remember the emotions? What sort of struck me most about being driven by a friend into London, who he'd picked us up at Southampton Docks, was, I, you know, I had a kind of colonial boy's view of of England as being mm. about kings and queens and uh, royalty and, you know, 
uh, all of that because that's what we learned at school. Mm. We didn't learn any real economic social history about England. It was all about <laughs> the upper classes. Yeah, yeah. And I remember being really struck by the degree of poverty uh, that was around the streets around us. That it's obviously, you know, people were not living any kind of grand life. Now, that's very naive mm. for a 16-year-old, but that was one of the things that... And it was cold and it was wet. I do think, though, is, isn't... I think this is one of those sliding door moments that I was alluding to earlier. I, 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 you, you'll, you'll tell me whether I'm right. You've arrived here, you've seen the effects of uh, uh, activism, right? You've, you've, you've been a fully immersed in, in, in a, in a, in a, in a full-blown crisis. Uh, you're driven out, you arrive here your instinct now and you're a, you know you're 16 years old i think I'm, I'm right in saying is not to look for security and safety but instead to sort of point yourself towards yourself now as a young man towards activism you well, are not you immediately are, you are, but by well by the age of 19 yeah. you're the chairman of yeah. a of an organisation yeah. that is <laughs> absolutely right at the centre stage this, yeah. in this country, right at the centre stage, is not long. I mean, no, when no, you say it's not point, fair point, Andy. But but I just you know want to sort of qualify that by saying that the first weekend we were in London, my mum and dad went on a nuclear um, disarmament demonstration. My brother and I went to Stamford Bridge to watch Chelsea. Right. And that first summer, we were going to Lord's Cricket Ground to see the West Indies play. As a Spurs fan, I'm tempted to say that that's just more evidence of you pointing yourself towards <laughs> yeah, well, crisis. But I, but I will back away from that. Yeah, we won't a, discuss it's the a reason. Dodgy, it's a dodgy argument. Uh, it is, <laughs> it's a yeah, flawed it's, argument. It's, it's, Let's talk about Stop the 70 tour. You were outraged by South Africa's refusal to allow the England team to tour in uh, 68 because they had a non-white player, Basil Oliveira. Uh, you were one of the first people... Uh, it seems to me, um, to realise the power of sport in politics. Um, you're 19 years old. How did you get to that conclusion? So, Well, first clearly. of all, I was sports mad, as you could gather um, from our recent uh, sort of exchanges. And I understood more than probably anybody else the importance of sport to white South African psychology mm. because I was a white South African boy. And what's most important to understand about that period is whereas apartheid was regarded with distaste, though not much was done about it in London or Washington or any of the capitals of the world, but that's a sort of parallel story. Uh, white South African teams, racist teams, because you could only play for your country if you were white, were fated at Twickenham and Lords and allowed into the Olympics and so on. So this gave them a sort of compensation for being regarded as... Uh, uh, for, for apartheid being disapproved of. Mm. And suddenly they were given hospitality in all the sports stadia and by, by, the, by the community. And so I knew if we could stop that we would really be hitting them hard. But I also... It's quite a conclusion for a 19-year-old. Well, yeah. Well, you're probably it, 17, it, 18 at this stage. It, it evolved because, as you say, the exclusion of Battle Oliveira, who by 1966, and I remember seeing him, uh, was an established England cricket test mm. player, um, born in the Cape Town area, a, a South African citizen of mixed blood and described officially in apartheid terms as coloured, had to come to England to further his career because he was a top cricketer. Mm. Got into the England Test Cream. Then the South Africans ban him from ban the tour. Yeah, and English cricket did not cover itself in glory. No, yeah. English cricket had a pretty yeah. sordid role in that, yeah. but yeah. that's you know a longer yeah. story. Yeah. And I, and then a few months after that, as if nothing had happened. I mean, this is unprecedented. You never had a government stepping in and banning England mm. from touring because they had a, a non-white player in, in the mm. side. Mm. And, and it was embarrassing to them because he was actually a South African-born <laughs> uh, person of colour. And then a few months later than that, as if nothing had happened, they issue an invitation to white South Africa to tour England in 1970. And I remember early in 1968 this news being absolutely furious about it. 
And I was by then involved in the Young Liberals and becoming increasingly involved and, and persuaded them to issue a press statement saying we were going to stop this tour. You've seen in the most visceral, dark... You know, you talk, you know, brilliantly about the funeral at that moment. You've seen the absolute worst of what can come from those kind of uh, uh, campaigns, that activism. And your conclusion is I'm going to have, as a, now I'm becoming an adult myself, that is absolutely the direction that I'm going to go in. Yeah, I suppose because partly through conversations with my dad, I'd always, he, he was somebody, and I think I've probably got inherited that, is he was somebody who always wanted to be practical, do things rather than just say things and to do something rather than to be somebody. So he was impatient of rhetoric and grandstanding in politics, of which there's a great deal, as you know. Mm. Um, he just wanted to get results. And I thought, I think we can do this, you know. I was taking part in marches to stop arms being sold to white South Africa, to stop economic trade with apartheid and all those kind of things. But that was really hard to, to get to secure because you, you're talking about jobs and the the way that the commercial system works and so forth. But I thought, this is something we could actually do. And I'd been on demonstrations where you held a pl placard outside Twickenham or, or Lord's Cricket Ground, and frankly, you were treated with disdain. People just marched past, past sometimes shouted um, abuse at you, but nothing changed. So you held your placard up, don't play with apartheid, nothing changed. Mm. He wrote a letter to Lord's uh, Cricket Ground or Twickenham and, and nothing changed. So I thought, well, let's use, because I've been kind of br then getting more politically involved as an 18-year-old in a period where there was the student revolt in Paris in 1968. There were the sit-ins at universities in there the US. There was a real mood and a real movement. Amongst radical youth, yeah. But so why don't we apply these nonviolent direct action tactics? And I read a lot about them and about Gandhi's approach and so on. Why don't we apply and the and the civil rights marches in America? Would uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968? So there was all this going on. Why don't we apply these tactics of nonviolent direct action to physically stop the matches by running on and sitting down on the pitch, which is what we started to do very successfully, but it came with a lot of risk and a lot of criticism yep. uh, here and in South Africa, of course. You were public enemy number one, as described in the South African media, I think. Um, the white must, media. The white media. That must have impacted you. That must well, have, There must have been moments where you thought, is this right? Well, I was getting... I was, not, not, sorry, not is this right. Do I push on? No, I don't think there was ever any doubt. It sort of strengthened my resolve, really. Um, the thing I felt personally most at, at a personal level was the hate within Britain. Because, it's the absence of fear that I'm interested well, in. No, Given I, that I you've seen the... Yeah, I don't, think it's, the... I don't think anybody really can eliminate fear. We're all so scared about some things you were sometimes. Certainly, you were certainly pushing it to one side. Yeah, because, because I thought, well, this is what we need to do. I think we can win this. It could be decisive, stopping this 1970 cricket tour. We've just got to get ahead and do it. And, yeah, there were all sorts of threats, and I got a... Ma you know, in those days, there were no emails or mobile phones, or, let alone social media. So it all came in kind of spidery, spidery sort of writing on letters and green ink and all these kind of... Uh, Death threats. You're oh, follow, yeah, all, all of that. Yeah. Followed by MI5. Yeah. Um, you find that out later, I think. Find that out later. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Then, and then a letter bomb. Yep. In June 1972, after we'd stopped the, the 1970 cricket tour, and I was hated even more for doing that, um, here in Britain as well, because most sports fans didn't understand why no. we were stopping their All sport. All they thought was you just, you just wrecked. Yeah. You just yeah. wrecked summer. And my first job interview, the, the, the question I was asked was, do you really hate cricket? This is at a trade union, you know. <laughs> I mean, I played cricket, but um, I loved sport. But, um, no, it didn't deflect me. And even when during the protests that I was organising and leading against the Springbok rugby tour, because that was in the winter of 1969-70 and became 
a kind of an arena to show that we could stop the 1970 cricket tour, which is our real objective. So we organised demonstrations uh, against that. Um, and I was warned by a solicitor friend that actually what I was doing was potentially breaching the law on conspiracy, specifically warned me about conspiracy. And um, even though minor offences like obstruction or public order offences or breach of the peace of these things, even if they were non-violent, if you put conspiracy in front of them... And combine them all. Combine them all, that became, you know, a, an imprisonable offence. But I thought, well... I'm not going to be deflected by that. I'm not going to be deflected by, by threats because then apartheid's won. You're being modest about it, uh, if, well, if, if you don't mind me challenging you for a uh, second. Well, because just... that is, again, a hell of a conclusion for someone of that age to reach. Except, I think, Andy, at that sort of age, you are far more likely to take risks than you are when you've got a mortgage and kids and grandchildren and not so if on. You've, not if you've seen what can happen. Most, yes. most people of that age, most of those young campaigners, as you described them, would not have had the life that you had and no. would not have experienced the things that no. you'd experienced. They would not have stood at a, in a church and pressed the button that sends a, uh, a, a, you know, a coffin containing the body of someone that they knew well uh, off yeah. into the flames. These are visceral things that you've experienced. Yes, and I, you I, are still... They clearly made you more determined, is the point. Well, I think uh, the way I'd put it, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, it strengthened my commitment not to be beaten. Mm. You know, sometimes you have to get defeated, like in an election, when you lose. Mm. Uh, that happens. But to actually be defeated in an unjust way was something that I... You just weren't having it. Uh, well, I, you know, I wasn't being... It wasn't sort of in a kind of big He-Man thing. It mm. was just saying, no, you're not going to threaten me um, and you're not going to bully me. Uh, if I think this is the right thing to do, I may or may not be right, that's for others to judge, but if I think this is the right thing to do, I'm going to stick to it. OK, so that's what you're thinking when you're stood in your sitting room at your home. Uh, holding a letter bomb that probably should have gone off but didn't because of a technical fault. Yes, when it was opened on the breakfast table by my younger sister, Sally, amidst a, amidst a pile of campaign mail, suddenly this thing appeared out of a brown envelope, a bulky brown envelope, which had uh, wires and uh, all sorts of electrical um, protrudences on, on it set in balsa wood. And, you know, what did you do? Um, Normally, the, because these were these are the kind of letter bombs that assassinated other anti-apartheid leaders around the world. And that was world. happening around the that world. That was happening around the world, and, and it continued for quite a while afterwards. Ruth First, who was a friend here in London, then went to work in Mozambique, in Maputo. She was blown up by that kind of letter bomb in 1982, so it continued. Mm. This is, so she was killed ten years later. But what do you do? It didn't go off because there was a... Scotland Yard told us there was a fault in the trigger mechanism, uh, other, a small wiring fault that um, prevented it from going off. Otherwise, they said it would have blown the whole house up, let alone me and my parents. What do you do with these situations? You either manage them, you try to deal with them and come through this crisis, if you like. So, How quickly would you... Let's use the letter bomb as an example. Yeah. How quickly did you get to that state of mind? Well, I thought... Again, back to lessons... How did you get? Do you well, think, I thought, do you think it's first instinct? Of, my first of all uh, thought was, this is dangerous. I don't know why it hasn't... I mean, it's da this is something dangerous. This is something very unusual amidst the campaign post. I better get it out of the house. So I picked it up and carried it out and stuck it on the pavement, um, which I didn't know what else to do. I thought, well... Mm. And then we warned the neighbours and so on um, and immediately rang the police. But... I thought, well, the thing to do here is to try and eliminate the threat as best you can. If I think about it now, maybe carrying it out could have caused the, uh, you know, the fault to rectify itself. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, in situations like that, you just act in the best way you can. 1972, you're prosecuted for criminal conspiracy in the way that you, you, you just sort of described, you, were, you know, you were warned it might happen. Um, uh, after the prosecution set out their case, you defended yourself. Just remind me, how old are you at this stage again? I was 22 then, You're but 22 I, years I wasn't expecting or planning to defend myself, but my 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 defence lawyers, having 
conducted the, the prosecution case, cross-examined the witnesses and did yes. it expertly. I went to their, um, the conference, ch their legal chambers in the temple, sort of august setting. Yes, indeed. I've been there. <laughs> you have, haven't you? Yeah. So you know what it feels like. And they said, look, the judge is going to ask us very early on in our defence case, what is your defence in law? Because I was charged with conspiring to commit nearly a thousand offences, um, the length and breadth of the British Isles, yes. uh, including an island which I'd never been uh, near yes. at that stage. Um, uh, and they're gonna, he's going to say, what is your, defense, your client's defence in law? And we're going to have to say he doesn't have one. So it was resolved that the best way was for me to conduct my own defence. Your uh, activism, alongside your university studies, um, continue, you get married, and then a truly astonishing incident. The police arrive at your door, you're arrested, uh, it transpires shortly thereafter, for carrying out a bank theft, bank robbery, essentially. Um, this is Kafka-esque stuff. Um, just explain what had happened. Well, when I look back on it, I think to myself, did that really happen? It was one of those moments. One of those moments. If, if you put it in a script and stuck it through the... Yeah. You know, put it into a meeting at Netflix, they'd say they'd laugh you out of the room. They would. They'd say this, this couldn't possibly happen. Yeah. So uh, police arrived at my door, said we want to take you down to the police station. Um, didn't tell me what it was about. I kind of queried this and they said there's been a bank theft. And that's the first I knew about anything. Uh, and I was taken down to Wandsworth Police Station, held for 11 hours. What had happened was somebody looking like me, evidence subsequently emerged, snatched £490 worth of £5 notes from a cashier in Barclays Bank, outside which, in, in Upper Richmond Road, Putney, near where we were living, um, outside which I'd actually demonstrated because of Barclays Bank's links, links to... Right. South Africa and its investments in South Africa, a campaign we subsequently won. So the thief snatches the money, runs down Putney High Street, up a side road, turns round, throws the money back, and says, there you are then, and escapes. There's a fresh fingerprint on that wad of notes, which wasn't mine, because my fingerprints were taken. They still proceed to charged me uh, and I was put on the side D parade which is a pretty scary experience um, and picked out by the cashier I'd never seen in my life before mm. whereas the bank, th bank staff who chased the thief and seen him at close quarters said he's not, I wasn't the, the thief um, so the police then have got the corroborative evidence they ignore the fingerprint they ignore the fact that the chasing um, a bank staff said this is not the guy they got and they some, put they me, got some they got some young kids who some young kids you too. Said, yeah, I think it yeah. was him. Yeah. And for, and and so they were kind of part of the evidence. Uh, and um, they, my saving grace on this, because it was a fairly close run thing when it went to the Old Bailey. My saving grace on this was that the elder of the three kids who had been chased joined the chase, sort of as a bit of fun. Told his dad, "That's not the man." He's not, they got the wrong one, saw me on television. And his dad, and I'll always be indebted for him, Terry McLaren is a cab, cab driver in London now. Um, and he was fantastic. He appeared as a witness for the, for the defence. He said, well, it wasn't me. Now, it turns out um, that this was a very elaborate attempt by South African security services to frame you for a robbery that they staged effectively. Yep. They had an agent who they thought looked a bit like you. Yep. They put him in the same clothes. They put him in, as I understand it, one of the things that helped enormously was that they they thought that, that he, he'd kind of got his, he, he sort of put his hair into your style. Of, yeah, and I'd sheer had... coincidence the night before you changed your Well, it. I think a few days before. A few I'd days had before different... you changed your hair style, yeah. which they weren't. Other than that, they thought that they'd absolutely cracked it. Yeah. This is, as I say, Kafka-esque stuff. Yeah that would drive most people, I suspect, to the brink of madness. The idea well, that there is this kind of operation underway yeah. that is designed only to put you in prison. How yep. did you react when you found out that's what this was all about? I thought, well, you know, this is a, 
not it's not the same as the conspiracy trial, but is part of the battle. And and but what was to 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 fight apartheid? But what was galling about this is that people might hate me politically or disagree with me fiercely, but I don't think anybody thought I was ever dishonest. Mm. And it really got to me that the terror was being charged with a you know a theft. Mm. Um, and so that that was... It was about your integrity. It was about integrity. It was, you know, yeah. politics, and, and particularly in the in the fight against apartheid, was a matter of integrity and morality as well. Mm. Um, politics can become a little more grey in some areas. But so I, it, it kind of hurt, hurt me. But I thought, you know, we've got to fight this and we've got to win it. Again, a moment that might have tipped you towards. Fortunately, it ends positively. There yeah. is a long trial, though. It's I mean, a two-week trial. It's, and... uh, again, you're, you know, you're sat in a courtroom in the Old Bailey, you know the cells are downstairs, yeah. you know where you're heading yeah. if, this, if this goes wrong. Yep. Difficult, difficult stuff to manage. It was difficult, and in, again, like the conspiracy law, it was reformed afterwards. Yes. So, uh, partly as a result, result of my case and others, because... You, you now need corroborative evidence. If somebody points a finger, finger at you, Andy, like they pointed at me yeah. and said he was the one what done it, yeah. you've got to have corroborative it's, evidence. It's not enough. In yeah. this case, the corroborative evidence, the forensic evidence of fingerprints was the other yeah. way. So another sliding door moment. Yeah. And if you decided, you know what, I've done my bit now. Okay, I've had a letter bomb. I've been framed for a robbery. Uh, all the experiences of my childhood, you know, I've done my bit. No one would have, no one would have, I think, argued with you. And yet you decide, no, 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 we're going to push on again. Each one of these moments causes you to push on. Well, otherwise, otherwise you're defeated, aren't you? Otherwise, the 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 kind of architects of apartheid would have won. So, when you're in the midst of that, before you get the not guilty, how are you avoiding the bitterness bullet? which is something that we discuss on this pod pretty frequently, because that is the real danger when you're in crisis, uh, particularly yes. when your integrity is under attack or that your life is being unseated in the way that they were attempting to unseat you. How yeah. have you, through your life, dodged the bitterness bullet? By not becoming embittered, because I think that doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, if, you, if you become embittered, if you become so angry that you are consumed by that anger, and it turns to bitterness and could easily turn to vengeance, then it actually diminishes you as a person. Now, it's easy to say that because I met many other victims of mistaken identity cases at the time, and the, their whole lives were turned upside down. Hmm. It, it kind of took over their lives and was all-consuming, and many of them had deep, deep mental health issues as a result. Um, I was fortunate in, in that I didn't, uh, partly because I was determined to avoid that. But I think what 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 you you need to to avoid is the consuming nature, the corrosive nature of bitterness, and uh, uh, because what that does ultimately it eats you up. I can't remember the exact quote from Nelson Mandela, but he he, he said words to this effect that. If you allow yourself to, cons to be consumed with vengeance, and bitterness is a sort of prelude to that, then you actually allow your opponents to win. All of these experiences, with shooting ahead here, I know, lead you, or, or do, you, do you not see them as leading you towards a decision to become a member of parliament? I think what, when I got elected as an MP, I had a clear mission to try and change things that's always been my kind of motivation to change things as i see it for the better to and to make a difference i don't think there's any point in being there unless you're making a difference to me the prestige of being an mp uh, even a minister or a cabinet minister was not to have the position uh, and you know in the case of a minister the the, the driver and the limousine mm. and or the car mm. and all of that stuff that never interested me i never knew what uh, an mp's salary was when i've got elected to become an mp it was not something that you know people may find that odd given all the stuff about expenses and so forth mm. but that never motivated that wasn't me. the interest yeah. no yeah you held some big jobs yeah um some truly interesting times 
As Northern Ireland Secretary, you helped uh, Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness form a government in 2007. You've said that you had to form friendships with both of those people without agreeing with them and without necessarily liking them. Um, your proudest political moment? Yes. I mean, the, the settlement that I helped negotiate under Tony Blair and with his chief of staff, J Jonathan Powell, very involved too, was the thing that, in a sense, a crowning moment, in, in my word, I, that sounds too, sounds grand and immodest. I don't mean it in that sense, but the thing that I felt most proud about, because that was an, an uh, it'll never happen moment. Yes. You know, when you saw... Ian Copper Paisley and, and Jerry, Jerry Adams, those bitter old blood enemies, mm. together mm. announcing Sinn Féin and uh, the DUP were going to form a government together, which they, they sustained for 10 years. That was a, a very proud moment. But I think that my early experiences uh, of the anti apartheid struggle and my background helped me because I wasn't seen as a traditional British patrician secretary of state. And insights that I got, including you referred to the fact you don't have to like people and certainly not to agree with them. I had fundamental disagreements both with Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness, who shared power together in government, uh, which I'm happy to discuss, but are not the point here. But I actually got to like both of them. And, and the thing you need to do in this situation is to find, you know, we're all human beings. Mm. You've got to find connection. You've got to find connection. So Ian Paisley, it turned out, was a great family man. He'd been brought up the traditional family morals as I had um, and courtesies and so on uh, in, in the way you go about your life. Martin McGuinness, <laughs> most improbably, and people who probably don't know this, I discovered was a, a mad, keen fan of, of England's cricket team. Right. So I just, that was the year when I first became Secretary of State and I was seeing him a lot in my office in Stormont Castle. Um, the Ashes series were on in, 19, in 2005 that England actually won. And he was he, a passionate English fan. He knew... England fan. The, he knew every player. He had an opinion on every player. Simon Jones, the Welsh medium uh, bowler, fast bowler, in, invented reverse swing, which for cricket aficionados was quite novel. He knew all about that. He, he had a disagreement with some of the team selections. Uh, I mean, so, so what you do in this situation is you find points of human contact mm. and you build trust. And trust doesn't mean to say, I agree with you or they agree with me. How much it's of, about... How, yeah, sorry, how much of your backstory was of use? What was their reaction to your backstory? Was that discussed when you're finding those moments of connection? Yeah, I mean, in the case of Sinn Féin, they had an, had had a relationship with the African National Congress, mm. so that was uh, a kind of common ground. Mm. There wasn't a lot of other common ground, mm. particularly, you know, their terrorist hinterland. Um, with Ian Paisley was to the right, significantly to the right of where where I was or am, uh, and he was intensely religious, and I'm I'm an agnostic, but. Um, for example, so, so they knew that they were dealing with a man of principle. I suppose and they, so. And they knew that they were dealing with a man who'd kind of put himself on the line. Whether, yes. Whether, obviously, a tremendous amount of nuance and differences and difficulty in and around that. But when they were, when you were sat at the table, they knew they were dealing with someone of conviction. Well, uh, I hope so. <laughs> um, but I also think they knew they were dealing with somebody who was pretty straight. Mm. So if I told them something, I was not telling them something to manoeuvre around or, or mm. be disingenuous. We're racing through your, your political career, for which apologies, uh, but let's move to 2008. You're caught up in an issue around undeclared political donations linked to your standing for the deputy leadership of the party. There's a long police investigation which eventually ends without charge, um, but you resign from government. How, how difficult was that? period piece it was and, I, and I suppose the question is given everything that we've heard the story mm. that we've heard did it cause you to kind of did any of that kind of come back at you emotionally you know there you are again in a in a very serious situation proper threat of 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 criminal uh, uh kind of prosecution how did how did you sort of react to all that i suppose is the question well it was pretty horrible 
But remember, not a penny was stolen by my deputy leader campaign. Mm. I didn't pocket any money from it. No. It was that we declared it was, about... It, it, was, it was about disclosure. Yeah. It was about the regulation that you needed to report a donation you'd received within 30 days. Yes. And um, about 100,000 of donations had been reported, as I'd instructed. But for reasons which I've never got to the bottom of, uh, my campaign hadn't reported the rest. And there were lots of other people in this situation, mm. but for some reason the Electoral Commission picked on me, I think, to make an example. And without making a party point, people don't tend to resign in recent times, or haven't tended to resign. You know, and I think what that was about, about not declaring all the donations, only some within the 30-day time, time scale, because as soon as I knew, I'd try to find you know, what had gone wrong and then we reported them. Mm. But it took a bit of time. Uh, uh, you know, people have done, in my view, immeasurably worse things uh, and not resigned. But I stood down and I did come back a year later, which I was, um, you know, I felt ex exonerated by and vindicated by to the Cabinet uh, as Secretary of State for Wales. But it was a pretty unpleasant time. Mm. really unpleasant because I've suddenly thought you know after all this after all we've been through mm. uh, including negotiating the Northern Ireland settlement only mm. the year before suddenly to be engulfed by so how did you manage that in, pra in practical terms um, well by, we bury, by burying yourself in the detail of it by well there was that you needed to to do that but no to try and escape some of that I mean we took more holidays that year Elizabeth my wife and I than ever before just thought sod it Mm. Forgive me for that, mm. that expression. Um, Don't worry, we've had a lot worse. On <laughs> right. But, so we took more holidays. We went for a six-week holiday to Spain, which we'd never done before, and just thought, we've got to get on with our lives. And you need to advocate that kind of approach. If you can... If you can. You've got to... Yourself. You must never neglect the solution to the problem. But um, try to kind of... To, 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 to sort of take yourself out of it in a way. Mm. But at the same time, this in the end is about your resilience as a personality. Do you think that the story that we've heard during the course of this podcast, do you think in each of those big moments of crisis, do, do you, you hold to the idea that, that, that resilience is kind of like a muscle as well, right? That it's got to be, uh, the more exercise it becomes... Yeah the kind of more resilient you can, you can... So, you know, lean into stress, I suppose. Uh, no one wants to you know, experience some of the things that you've experienced. But the tendency these days is, is in the fashion these days, is to kind of move away from stress, to not, to you know, to, to try and avoid it. Whereas you, yeah. uh, in each of these sliding door moments, have, that's really what I'm getting at about, about, about the approach that you seem to have taken, is no, I can deal with this. And I'm going to deal with this, and I'm going to lean into it. Well, I'm going to try and deal with it yes. as best I could. You know, remember, yes. in this situation, apart from constructing a defence case, as it were, with lawyers, I had to engage. Yes. Um, and making sure that the truth, from my point of view, was fairly before the, the the prosecutor looking at whether to charge me or not. And it took, you know, nearly a year yes. to go through this. That was one of the most stressful. You had this thing hanging over you the whole time. Yeah. But it was, it, in the end, Andy, it was for me, I thought, this is something really bad that's happened to me. Ultimately, I could have been my fault because I hadn't, you know, <laughs> managed the deputy leader campaign with the forensic attention that I maybe should have, but I was also Secretary of State for Wales and Secretary of State for Work and Pensions uh, and, and so on. And the campaign had actually started while I was still Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. So if I think back on it, there were things I should have, mistakes that were made that mm. I should have had that extra kind of bandwidth. But at the, core, at the core of it, you felt this is unfair. I felt deeply unfair. Yeah. I felt I was being victimised. All sorts of leading politicians were breaking the law, quote unquote, in terms of, of contravening the regulations about reporting donations, including George, George Osborne, mm. the shadow chancellor at the time. Uh, who, who admitted it. Um, but that I was the only one, as it were, facing the dock and the, and the termination of my career. I thought it was deeply unfair. But you still managed to dodge the, the bit in this bullet. Yeah. And, there must and have I, been moments where you were... Uh, yeah, I think the that, only that thing, came, if I think back on it, thing. yeah, I, it did take a bit of the zest for 
high politics out of me. And I thought, you know, if this is what you, you have to go through, is this worth it? Mm. But I was pleased to come back and to, you know, try and win the um, election campaign in 2010. And I seemed at the time in the cabinet, apart from me and Peter Mandelson, I don't want to be immodest, it seemed to me the only ones who's really, really fighting to win that 2010 campaign. But that's, that's another story. So the fashion, Peter, as we... Uh, thank you for this conversation, but as we, as we come to a close... It's a pleasure. The, the fashion, of course, at the moment is for, is for political comebacks. <laughs> My old boss. <laughs> well, you've been, you've been cheeky office. enough in this, yeah, uh, this interview, uh, Andy. Uh, so, I, so come I don't on. see that happening. If you get the call... I don't see that happening. What, something more informal? I mean, are you? Are you well, I, mean, look, how, I mean, how are you seeing it? I mean, are you feeling pretty confident about Labour's chances, uh, the election? I think, I think the country has given up on on the Tory government, uh, and I and I notice a lot of people who voted Conservative are just absolutely fed up, and there's lots of reasons, without getting very political, for them to be so. So I think I think they want to change. Um, the degree to which they have confidence in us as a Labour government waiting in the wings to be what they actually put their cross against in, in the ballot box, I, I don't think that's finally decided. Mm. So if you're asking me now, I think the Conservatives will be defeated. I think that we will probably form a government. I joke about comebacks, but there is also, and I feel very strongly about this, we've touched on this with some other guests previously, what we need in politics is people with experience, people who live the life. Yeah as has been well demonstrated during the course of this conversation, you have lived a life, an extraordinary life. Your experience is deep and rich and therefore useful. So if you do get Possibly. a call... Well, well, what, <laughs> actually, actually, I'm not even going to ask you, what would you do if you get the call? It's, it's people with that kind of experience, is my, my point is, who absolutely should be getting the well, call, I, whatever I mean, the role is. I, I think however fair, formal yeah, or informal. Uh, you know, whether it's some sort of envoy role or whatever. You know, if there's a job to be done and and somebody asked me to do it, then I'd want to look at it, you know, very carefully because I, I still have a desire, as, as in my House of Lords work, where I've done a number of things focusing on particular areas to, to change things for the better. But am I looking to go get on uh, to become a minister? No. And I've made that clear to our excellent Labour leader of the Lords uh, in... in Angela Smith, I said, no, I'm, I didn't want to come on the front bench. I'd done 12 years as a minister. I'd done two years as a front bencher before 97 and two years afterwards. And it's been a privilege to do it, but I want to do other things. Um, Peter, thank you for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you for telling us your story in such an amazing fashion. I used the word remarkable right at the start. I think it is entirely appropriate. Um, and thank you for your wisdom. Um, fascinating conversation and one I think that does provide uh, uh, some really useful, actually, guidance and advice for people who are facing their own difficulties. So thank you for that. It's a pleasure and a privilege to do it. If you've enjoyed this conversation with Peter, please do give us a rating and a review. It really helps. Uh, Peter's book is out, The Elephant Conspiracy. Uh, you can find the link in the episode notes. And if you hit subscribe, wherever you download your podcasts from, you will find loads more useful crisis conversations. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok, and you can watch the full episodes on YouTube. Just search for Crisis What Crisis podcast. You can also find full transcripts of this and every episode on our website, crisiswhatcrisis.com. Thanks again for joining us. 